Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and today's podcast is going to be an eye-opener for many who are experiencing some of the collateral damage that can flow from divorce. The idea is to let you know what you can expect and to let you know what you can do about it. I have two special guests with me today, Jan Yuhas and Jillian Yuhas. Together, they're better known, and I love this, as the Love Twins, um, and they're the dynamic duo behind their brand, Entwined Lifestyle, through which they provide relationship and lifestyle coaching to clients all around the world. They both, and this is important, they both have their masters in marriage and family therapy and are certified mediators, and they've made it their mission to guide men and women in finding their inner voice, owning their worth, setting healthy, healthy boundaries to feel invincible in their relationships personally and professionally. They're also prolific writers. They've been featured on websites, including some of our favorites, Thrive Global, Take the Lead, Yahoo Lifestyle, Bustle, Your Tango, and many more, Medium. Um, and they've also appeared on Jam TV, Dana Being Dana TV, A Wheelhouse Radio, and now a Divorce and Beyond podcast. So I'm super happy to have you ladies with me today. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you for, for having, having us, us, Susan. So for those of you who are watching on video, you know the inside secret here. The, Jan and Jillian are identical twins, and they just spoke in, in unison, which I think is, is one of those, um, those interesting things about twins. But I, I met you two recently here in Chicago. I found you. I just want to mention your uh, social media. I found you through Instagram, um, noted that you were here in Chicago and reached out because I wanted to meet you. And I was so happy that I did so because what you are doing out there and what you're trying to help people do is so in line with especially what I'm trying to help people with, with this podcast. Um, so I, I'm thrilled to have you on the podcast and we're going to have some other fun things that we're doing in the future. So again, thank you for being here. Um, today, we're going to be talking about something that I don't think most people think about when they're going into a breakup or the ending of a relationship, a divorce. But we as divorce professionals know that this is sort of the collateral damage of divorce. You know, everybody knows that they need to separate out their finances, they need to separate homes and that, but they don't always think about some of the other perhaps unintended consequences of that breakup. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I think that that is you know, going to be very impactful for a lot of people because often this collateral damage is, is what carries over into life after the breakup. So, you know, let's start with the title issue. Who gets to keep the friends? What are we talking about there? Right. So when it comes to divorcing, you're used to knowing that that relationship has ran its course and you know that that person is kind of no longer probably going to be in your life, but you have all these extended relationships beyond that relationship and our relationships are what the true meaning of essence of life. So even though you've gone to that painful divorce and breakup, you also might be going through some other painful breakups or more or less separating yourself from these additional relationships you've had throughout that entire relationship, such as, you know, the friends or even family members. So when it comes to moving on, you might have to have a discussion with your ex-spouse, like who gets the friends? Do I get to continue being friends with this person? Are we going to have our separate friends? Say you have a couple that you became friends with throughout the marriage. Is the wife still going to stay friends with the wife? Is the husband still going to be staying friends with the husband? It's something you'll have to discuss because moving forward in your life, you're not going to want your new lifestyle to be getting back to your ex. That's actually a really key point there. From your perspective, if you stay friends with those joint friends, the ones who are still going to be friends with your ex and who are going to be friends with yours, it really becomes sort of a, your lives are still, I'm going to use your, your uh, title there, entwined. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out with one of them and then it would be natural in their conversation with your ex that they talk about it. And in many ways that can feel invasive, I think, for people. Do you really want your ex to know who you're dating, what you're doing, what's happening in your life? And I would also posit, do you really want to know that kind of detail about your ex's life? 
Is that healthy for you? What do you, you two think about that? I think you have to decide what topics of conversation you're going to have with that friend, knowing that things could get somehow transferred back to their you know, significant other, which gets then, of course, trickled down into your ex-spouse. So I think being aware and conscious of your topics of conversations, so that way you're creating healthy boundaries for yourself, knowing that if the information does get passed down, it's not going to you know, trigger you or upset you, but you're aware of the things you are communicating, knowing that there is a tie between, you know, between your ex-spouse and their friend, your friends. Right. And it, it can actually be even more complicated because we're talking about you and your ex making decisions about the friends, but often they make decisions about you. They make a decision like we're going to stay friends with him or you, Bob, we're better friends with him. So, you know, Mary's going to sort of get cut out of our social circle or there's just that discomfort that people feel intact couples can feel uncomfortable with you know, divorce couples, there's that syndrome people talk about, about the, you know, divorce is catching, divorce is contagious. And so I have seen it. I saw it in my own life when I got divorced, that the friends will often take sides right. uh, and you have to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah you, might, yeah. you might feel like your friends have kind of abandoned you or left you if they do decide to choose your ex, but you have, that's something you have to be prepared for given the fact that you're kind of, you know, separating your lives now and going down different paths. And you know what, that's, it might be hard at first, but at the same time, your new path is gonna bring new friendships into your life and you're going, you will be fine eventually. So just in that, you might have a little bit of pain through that whole process, but you'll get over it eventually once you are able to feel you know, like you're happier in your new life. I think that's an important point because I, again, I experienced that myself. You may feel a little abandoned right. by your friends when they either side, you know, often people feel they need to take a side, even if it's not something you feel that people need to do, they will. Um, but your life in a, unentangling it from that marital relationship or that relationship you had with your ex, part of that is changing your environment. And part of that is changing some of the friends perhaps. So it, it's a natural part of the process. I think it's really important that we, you know, people be aware that that's coming though. It's much easier to deal with things if you're aware that it's going to be an issue going down the road. And another area, you touched on it earlier, and this is even a little more complicated, is the family relationships. So this is one of those areas where you may have become very close with your ex's family, um, or especially if you have children with your ex. And so these are their grandparents, aunts and uncles and cousins. And so you get the same situation. They may take sides. They may want to cut you out entirely, but how do they do that if they have grandchildren with you? Or you may want to maintain some sort of a relationship with them. So what are your thoughts on that thorny little issue? That's definitely a thorny little issue as blood is always thicker than water. So when it comes to family relationships and um, say perhaps the whole entire time you were, became best friends with your ex-spouse's cousin throughout the entire marriage, um, again, you're going to want to ask your ex-spouse probably how they feel about you continuing that friendship with that cousin after you've decided to go separate ways. And you have to decide as well, can I trust this cousin not to, again, deliver information back to my ex-spouse given that they are blood and you guys even though you guys have been friends throughout the whole marriage can i trust this friendship to still be a very genuine trusting friendship moving forward um so that's definitely you want to ask your ex-spouse how they feel about it moving forward and then also ask that family member that you developed a friendship with how they would like to proceed forward and what they think and what their thoughts are so you're going to have to have some sticky conversations in terms of moving forward now, if there are children involved, go ahead. I think it can, you know, when there's children involved, especially with, you know, going to maybe sporting events or dance recitals, you know, the ex, the, uh, the ex family is still going to be there. So it's best to be respectful of those family members when they're there supporting your children. That way the children know that they are loved by all family members and there's not going to be discord or, 
issues because then the children start to blame themselves. So, you know, once again, I think you have to be cordial, be polite, but also know they're no longer your in-laws. They are now your exes. You know, those they're his parents and that's where you have to draw the line. Yeah, I've seen that over and over again where a client will be quite distressed because they became close to their mother-in-law or, you know, or the mother-in-law. I mean, here's a situation. The mother-in-law was the caregiver for the children. Mm -hmm. um, that happens all the time. And we're going to talk a little bit more about caregivers, but it's even more complicated in these layers. And so, you know, what you're talking about, I think is so important for someone to, you know, take a moment and think about as they unentangle their lives, but they also have to take their kids into consideration is how can you still facilitate your children's relationship with their relatives while keeping yourself safe emotionally or, or however that, whatever that means. Um, you know, I have a client right now who's going through a great deal of stress over should she be driving her children over to her in-laws so the kids can have time with them. Now, traditionally the kids did but she doesn't want to do this anymore. And so she's struggling with it and she's coming to the conclusion that the right thing to do is to allow her children to still have that relationship. Um, so I, you know, she, she'll work through that, but it's, it's an issue that comes up and needs to be addressed. Right, that's an issue that um, we've seen as well from some of our clients. So usually what I recommend in that scenario, because yes, it's important for the children to solve that relationship with their grandparents and extended family. Um, usually, I recommend in terms of that scenario is that the grandparents try unless it's like impossible and given you know living situations and whatever usually I have the grandparents that they are supposed to spend time with the grandchildren when it's that parents parenting time in order to eliminate some of the conflict that the ex parent is feeling from the ex a lot of ex a lot of yeah. <laughs> the ex family the ex family. partner yeah. In order to, because when you have your parenting time, then that, that's your parenting time. And when your spouse, ex-spouse has a parenting time, that's their parenting time and that's their extended family's parenting time as well. So yeah. I, good point with that, you know, and, and certainly a good way to keep some space between those, those relationships. Um, another area that will come up as maybe a loss for people, and this happened when we talked to get ready for this episode, this topic came up and it reminded me that in my own divorce, there was a restaurant slash bar that my ex-husband and I went to all the time. It's where we saw our friends. It's where we met. It's where, you know, all these things. And it was an issue in my divorce. Who got to keep the bar? <laughs> You know, who got to, and I walked away in the, in terms of letting him keep it because I wanted that healthy boundary, that fresh start in my life that we're talking about. But you had an example that was similar and, and it, it's a great tale for people to understand some of the other complications. Right. Another issue might be going to the gym. So I had a client who her and her ex spouse belonged to the same gym and now it was technically her gym that she always went to and all of a sudden once the divorce started going through he started going to the gym all the time as in order to almost either run into her or to um he was more or less just it's, it wasn't really his gym, but it's like he made it became his gym. So then it became a bit of a conflict issue between the two of them, because obviously our self-care is vital, especially when going through this process and going to the gym is supposed to be her self-care. But then if she's running into her ex-spouse, then it's almost inflicting even more emotional pain or, you know, some those feelings are coming up. So you might want to decide with your ex-spouse, okay, are you going to the gym in the morning? I'm going in the evenings, or you might have to find a new gym altogether if you are not on amicable terms and can't move past going, seeing each other at the gym at the same time. Yeah, it, that is a great point. And I thought when you told me this story, I was thinking about it because a lot of people do start going to the gym when they're going through a breakup from the perspective of it's wonderful for self-care, stress, exercise is wonderful for stress, but there's also that mental 
Um, I want to get in better shape. I want to look better. I'm getting back out there in the world. And I also, you know, I, I happen to go to the gym that you're talking about and I watch, you know, people meet people at the gym. And the last thing you want to be doing when you're out there on the treadmill jogging along is watching your ex-husband chat to the woman on the, you know, treadmill next to him. It's just, it's invasive or it can feel invasive. So putting some thought in ahead of time to whether it's the gym or the bar or, you know, the, the, the coffee house that you go to all the time, putting some thought into some boundaries around it or some rules that the two of you can agree on for both of your benefit can save you some, some stress or give it up and go find a new one. Right. Cause you're already going through that pain. So you don't want to inflict more in pain on yourself through the process. And that's what sometimes this can do if you are in those types of sticky situations where you're at the gym and your ex is, yeah, chatting it up with a girl next to him. That's not going to be something that you want to see or, you know, so it's best just to move forward. And yeah, like you said, maybe find a new gym. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause it, it can extend. I mean, the gym's one thing, but again, going back to those situations where you have children, um, there are extended social places that we go to in our lives that include our children. Um, we identified sort of the country club can be one, the YMCA or the gym, you know, uh, this gym that we're happening to talk about also has a childcare and a kids program and it's a very family centered place. So you may find yourself in a situation where letting that particular place go might not be as easy because your kids are associated with it. So maybe it's what your children are used to is to go to the pool at that club or place, you know, during the days in the summer. And whether it's your parenting time or your ex's parenting time, your kids still want to do the same stuff. So how do you get some nice boundaries around that? I think when it comes to like almost a, even in your parenting agreement, you can establish if they're going to keep the country club as part of, you know, a financial investment that, you know, if the husband wants to keep it because that's where he golfs, then coming up with days that the ex-spouse is allowed to take the children or if she has them on the weekends, you know, just be honest and upfront and communicate, am I allowed to take the kids? Maybe every other weekend, come up with a plan you know, that works for everybody, or if it's just during the summer, of course, during the summer months here in Chicago, you know, maybe it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or maybe it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and she takes the kids to the pool, and the other days, when he has the kids, then it's his responsibility to take the kids to the pool when they want to go, so just being, you know, respectful of each other's time, but also communicating when you're going to take the kids to the pool, that way the kids are still not being affected, and they're losing out on the fun, but then you're not also running into your ex. Yeah, because I, I want to distinguish here. We're not talking about the situations where, say, your kids are in a baseball game and you're both going to go and be adults and sit in the stands and cheer them on. We're talking about your day-to-day -day lives and those places where, as a family or an intact unit, you used to maybe do things together or do with your children. We're you know, talking about trying to come up with creative ways where you can maintain normality for your kids, but establish some sense of space for your new life. Correct. Because that's a great deal of the healing journey from the breakup is creating your new life. And if you're constantly coming face to face with your ex and what's happening in their new life, it, it can feel very dis disruptive and, and difficult to let it go or move beyond it. You know, so, so some of these, these issues may sound very simple, but I have heard over and over again, and I'm sure you have as well from clients, that this is actually sometimes some of the hardest stuff that goes on in a breakup is the disentangling of the minutiae of your life. You know, and another one, and, and I referenced it earlier, but it's been a huge issue. I have had litigation over this issue. Who gets to keep the nanny or the babysitter? Um, and that's because finding someone that you, you know, your nanny especially, or your au pair, or your regular babysitter almost becomes a member of your family. And they're very close to your children and they make your lives easier. This isn't just a, a, a case of, um, you know, somebody who's caring for your children. This is someone you trust. 
that you vetted that has knows you, knows your family, knows your children, and being faced with having to give them up, go find someone else in your new household can be daunting, but there need to be some boundaries around that relationship as well, because now you have a person who almost lives in your house or does going between the two households. Right. That can definitely be a very, again, a very um, complicated situation can come up in terms of if you have a nanny that's going back and forth between the two homes. And like you said, yes, it's somebody that you've trusted with your children for a lengthy period of time, probably. So to let that person go or decide, you know, which spouse is going to keep that nanny because a new one might have to come in the picture just because it's healthier than having that you may not want that nanny seeing everything going on in your home. And then she or he may go into your ex-spouse's home and things might unintentionally slip out of her mouth, the things that she's seen in your home into your ex-spouse. So it's kind of a blurred line there that we kind of, if you can separate it, is re I recommend you know finding your own new hired help between the handyman, the house cleaner, the nanny, all of those people that are coming into your home should not be the same individuals going into your ex-spouse's home, just in order to keep clear lines. Yeah, that's a great point, because it's not just the nanny. It's the, you know, usually you have one spouse who has taken care of a great deal of the household details. They know who the plumber is. They know who the regular babysitting list is, who you can call at the last minute if you need someone. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's been an issue in cases I've had where someone's like, hey, those are my people. That's my team that I've built. Those are my relationships that I have. I don't have to give those to you or I don't have to share all of that with you. Go find your own. Um, and it can cause conflict between parents or between ex well, and then spouses. Have, some of the professionals, they don't want to be stuck in the middle of the couple because, of course, they might be asking questions to gather information. Well, what's he got in his house? Or, you know, is, did you notice that there's any woman's, you know, new stuff? Like that he has a new, like, significant other staying over, of course, once people start dating. So, you know, or even like the accountant, like, finances might get sort of intermixed if you still keep your, you know, ex's last name and they think that, you know, the accountant might just accidentally think you're still married somehow because you still have the same name and he just thinks that, oh, I'm still going, I'm still talking to you as if you're the couple, even though you've parted ways and separated. So a lot of stuff can still get intermixed, just like when you live with someone, of course, the mail still comes with all their information on it for a period of time. Yeah, that's one I always tell my clients, get your mail forwarded right away because you don't want that, your mail all still going and being in the control of someone else who might not be happy with you. Um, but you bring up a really good point about external professionals and this comes up all the time in divorce is it would be very common for a couple to have the same accountant, the same financial advisor. They have joint finances. But when you are going through a divorce and when you're divorced, often the advice you might get from that type of professional, it would be different for one of you than it might be for the other. And you have to make a decision very often, even when it's been a long-term relationship, as to whether it's a good idea to stay with that professional or go and find someone else. And I'll tell you, I know it's also uncomfortable for the professional. Uh, many times a professional does not want to have anything to do with handling both sides of, of that case. And so that's another area where there should be some consideration around whether you even want to get your advice and have your finances handled by the same person that's handling your exes. And it's not that it creates conflict between you and your spouse, but it puts that third party in a difficult place. And it also can create in your mind maybe a question as to whether the advice you're getting is fully neutral or fully centered towards you. Well, yeah, there's that line of confidentiality that can accidentally be crossed, not intentionally, but you know, you're trying to part ways. And if he's been the accountant for 20 some years and saw you as like a couple, then all of a sudden he's got to learn to, you know, separate one spouse from the other. It can, you know, create complex situations or conflict for the accountant thinking I've been helping them as a couple how am I, how do I separate myself and help the spouse and then help the wife and not 
impose each other's finances on each, you know. Right. And they may know things about your finances or things that have gone on in the past that would be helpful for one of the people to know, but the other party might not want the other person to know. It really can put them in a difficult situation. So I have always recommended to my clients who perhaps were not the ones handling the finances during the relationship that they go out and create a new team of fi financial advisors, a tax professional, an investment advisor. Maybe that's the same person, maybe it's, it's different people, but get your own team together. That's part of building your new life, creating this new identity in your life, you know, as, as the name of the podcast, Beyond Divorce there, right? So um, a lot of thought isn't just getting through the divorce around building your team, it's building that team beyond for your new life. Absolutely. Yeah, you definitely want to try to separate as much as possible in areas that you can. And, you know, once again, like we talked about family. Sometimes that's a hard one. Sometimes friends is a hard one. But if there's, like, hiring professionals, that's definitely a much more easier separation. And we def highly recommend it because it just makes your life so much easier. And you don't have to run into them going into the office, perhaps when you see them, oh, he just did his taxes, not here I am running into him. Like you're creating chances and we're trying to eliminate chances of actually running into our ex-spouse. Yeah, sometimes you just actually need some space. You need to create space in your life. And I think that's the point that we're talking about here and we've touched on the word, but let's like just define this. It's boundaries. It's creating healthy boundaries in your new life. And that's very much a part of that is creating some boundaries between your ex and you, between your old life and your new life. So, you know, I know that you have, this is one of the things you told me about when we first met, and I love your creative names, but you have a Boundary Badasses program, so which I just think is a, a great name. Um, but, you know, it's such a key and vital, important thing that people need to do in moving forward, tell us about that Boundary Badasses program. So we have an eight course module, and yes, it's called Boundary Badass. It helps people own their self-worth, rebuild that life that they might the, they may have lost their self going through the divorce, rebuilds their confidence, and helps them set healthy boundaries in their life with anyone, could be family, could be their ex-spouse, could be anyone that friendships as well. So they help set boundaries in their life and own their self-worth so they can move forward in having a new healthy lifestyle. Yeah, it teaches them how to have constructive communication and be able to come from a place of value versus emotion. So people are more likely to listen when you're coming from a place of that logic versus coming from a reactive place. So helping people communicate to respond. We have like our three C's, use a calm tone of voice, a constructive language, and keep your message concise. Like that's a big thing. If you're sending paragraphs, people aren't going to be able to respond to you in a way that's gonna get a positive you know, result or solution. So we're all about helping people get to the root of the issue by setting a boundary. And those boundaries are sometimes not always for other people or with other people, but they're for yourself. So you can feel more at peace and feel powerful using certain words that allow you to get traction in your own life. I love that you, you say that because, especially about the communication, because really boundaries start there. You know, with communicating effectively, not just communicating, um, you know, I, we've all seen those emails from our clients that they sent to their ex that are, you know, nine pages long, bold, highlighted, underlined, uh, referencing, you know, with attachments, et cetera. And you're right, that's not going to get the attention and it's not what, what effectuates the boundary that you need. Um, and really those boundaries are healthy for both sides. Um, one party can resist boundaries. That happens quite often, especially in certain high conflict relationships or where the conflict feeds one of the parties. Um, so they, the boundaries you try to set up will be resisted, um, but they are what you need to be healthy. And you have to, at some point, stop worrying too much about the other person in that type of situation and realize where your boundaries need to be to protect yourself. 
Yeah, and also when the person's resistant, we have a way of asking certain questions that allows us to shut down that conflict before we do set the boundary, which allows our, you know, be able to get our needs met, but using discovery questions allows us to gather more facts. That way we're understanding the other person so that way we're learning to negotiate and position ourselves in a way that allows us to get the response that we want. So before we actually set the boundary, we want to discover more information first and foremost, and that shuts down that conflict right away because the other person doesn't under, really realize what it is that you're doing that's going to diffuse their thought process. Yeah, you're diffusing the emotion in order to get to the facts in order to resolve the discord. That's great. That is, that's so key as, a, as an attorney who, you know, specialized in high conflict divorce. I wish every client I ever had could have heard what you just said, because it is the key to leaving that high conflict relationship behind, escaping from it. I just did an episode with um, Victoria, uh, um, Virginia Gilbert, who wrote a book about transcending your high conflict divorce. And a lot of it is putting up those healthy boundaries and creating that communication style that allows you to separate out from you know, the other side. So that is wonderful. I, I hope that there's been, I think there's a lot in what we've talked about here that's going to open eyes for people about what they need to be aware of and, and the boundaries they need to set. To go further, how can they get in touch with you? Um, so they can get in touch with us at entwinedlifestyle.com. And we also wanted to offer a special discount as well for those who are watching this podcast. So 30 days after this podcast airs, you can get our Boundary Badass program at 20% off with a special code LIFESTYLE20. And then also if you're interested in um, having an accountability partner, someone to really help you overcome those difficult emotions and move forward in life. Uh, we're also offering a 20% discount on our first month of one-on-one -on -one coaching to anyone who hears this podcast. So that is, thank you. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to reach out, get some help with your boundaries or, or lifestyle coaching because this is really one of those areas, and it's a, it's a continuous theme on my show here, is that you do not need to go through all of these changes in life alone. And a guide or guides um, who know what they're doing will, will be transformative for you. And so I encourage everyone to reach out and to set some healthy boundaries as you move forward. So ladies, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise and wisdom. I will put all of the contact information and your special offers in the show notes, but thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> There's that stereo again. <laughs>